get it all the time. I've, uh, I've been teaching physics for eight years. I've uh, been a high school teacher for eight years, and uh, every time people ask me, what do you teach? Uh, I say, oh, I teach physics. Immediately, it unleashes a barrage of feelings and anxieties, unprovoked, all of your deep-seated childhood emotions all coming out at the same time. Oh, I didn't like physics. I couldn't do it. I was never good at math. You should have met my high school teacher. He was no good. On and on we go like this. I've got a few questions for you. If you're one of those people that doesn't like physics, I'd like to ask you this. When you wake up in the morning and you see some very strange phenomena like this, these are icicles growing upward from an electrical wire. What do you do with that? Do you whistle a happy tune and keep walking to work? Or do you stop for a second and say, what in the world is going on here? I cannot explain this. How do icicles grow upward? Or maybe your eye is quick with some detail and you'll see, um, I hope you can catch this, the spokes on the top part of this wheel have disappeared. The spokes on the bottom of the wheel are rigid and easily visible. What kind of physics is visible here? Do you stop with moments like this and say, I sort of wish I knew what was going on here because I'm a curious learner. There's two kinds of people, really. They're the people who are happy going around in the world without getting answers to the natural curiosities that are seated within us. They're happy to borrow from and look past and not really um, follow their inborn curiosities and figure out why things work the way they work. There are people who are happy to borrow from the natural everyday technologies that we rely on and never stop to pay homage and respect to at least how they work. It's amazing. I don't think any of those people are here today. You guys are TED listeners, which means you have a natural curiosity in you already. That's what brings you out to hear all kinds of philosophical and new ways of thinking things, looking at old things and thinking new thoughts. I'd like to actually introduce to you a handful of ways that we use physics all the time. Yes, whether or not you've ever taken high school physics, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about common everyday physics. So follow this idea. You've got two reams of paper, a red one, a white one. You, of course, need a red sheet of paper. How do you get it out? Well, you sort of pry back the white ream of paper. You grab the top sheet of red paper, and you pull really, really slowly and gradually, right? No, you pull it out quickly. What have you proven? You know that the coefficient of kinetic friction is always less than the coefficient of static friction. How do you know that? Who taught you that? <laughs> Isn't this fascinating? That's physics. It's always like that. Why is it when you're up on a ladder and you're painting the eaves, you've got your ladder like this, and you're trying to reach a little bit further like this, you lift your leg. What are you doing with your leg? Why are you tipping your leg up this except proving that you understand the principles of cantilever? Why, if you are about to fall off a precipice, do you fall forward and you say, whoa, and you go like this? What are you doing with your arms? Trying to flap like a bird because you don't want to fall? Or are you proving that you understand the complex concept of conservation of angular momentum? <laughs> Why when you make your bed in the morning? I hope some of you do. Do you take your sheet and you go like, you know how it goes, this. How did you know about V equals F lambda? <laughs> this is a wave, that's the wave equation, the universal wave equation. I would love to pass a rule on people who say I am too simple to be curious about physics. I'd like to create a declaration. From now on, you people have to walk with your right hand and your right foot together and your left hand and your left foot together. This tells me and everyone around you that you don't understand the concept of arms being penduli. And actually, they work in opposite succession to counterbalance your motion. Here's how you're going to walk. Okay, just for one day, because if you're not going to understand how a pendulum works, then you're not allowed to use them. <laughs> I haven't talked about airplanes or cars or anything complex. I haven't talked about engineering. But in fact, we've come to rely on technology every day. There's an old expression that goes something like, don't bite the hand that feeds you. If we rely on basic, not technologies, just normal physics, in our day-to-day -day experience, 
then aren't you curious to know how it works? So I've actually brought in a few things to show you. There's two ways of teaching physics. I could tell you fc equals mv squared over r. Are you curious? Didn't work. That's the engineering approach. And you need to know that if you're going to talk about on or off ramps, or if you're going to spin a pail above your head. Uh, but instead, because that didn't elicit a whole lot of curiosity, I decided to go to the dollar store. I got a non-stick pizza pan, two bucks. I put some string on it like this. And yes, a very real, very breakable glass container. I'm just going to make a swing out of this. Every child gets on a swing at some point in their life. And they go something like this. And like every child, they decide, how high can I swing on this swing? <laughs> the cameramen are watching their electrical equipment right now. <laughs> Did I tell you there's no Velcro on this? There's no adhesive. There's no tape. This is a non-stick pen. I'm about to stick something to it. A child, every child out of curiosity at some point says, I wonder if I go higher and higher, what will happen? And every child at some point would dream about doing this. <laughs> Makes you curious, doesn't it? You non-physics people, explain. <laughs> How am I doing this? I have a different question for you right now. When I ask my high school kids, hey, how do I stop? They say, oh, no problem, Mr. Rob, just slow down. I say, okay, Here, I'm slowing down. They say, no, 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 speed up, okay, okay. All right, what? I don't know, how am I gonna stop? One day I was driving home because physics is an everyday phenomenon. And I was watching a crane operator lifting. Yeah, she's hiding, it's okay. You don't trust physics, do you? We'll talk after. I watched a crane operator as he was lifting a very heavy steel girder. And I noticed he had tons of metal that he had to actually figure out a way of dispersing this momentum before crashing down a wall in order to put it down. And in fact, what he did is very gradual. He stopped it like that. He knew what he was doing. He knew physics. There it is. <laughs> physics. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very common demonstration. We would love to do that if we have a pail or something that we fill out with a five gallon pail and we like to swing it over our heads, right? And that's amazing. It's one of those high committal things. You're in it or you're not in it. <laughs> We've had a few kids get baptized in class because they weren't fully in it. Um, I've got another demonstration for you as well. I'm hoping to evoke some curiosity in you. It's just a regular copper pipe. And uh, just to show you, there's nothing in the pipe. I just brought a couple pens. What happens if I touch a pen to a copper pipe? Nothing. And I should take the lid off. Here we go. Red pen, copper pipe. Oh, it fell through. Did I do that right? Obviously, that's what's going to happen. Now, if I have a magnet, and again, it's just a simple basic magnet. And you know, of course, in, in, the, in the academic terms, we say this is non-ferrous. That means this magnet is not interested. It's not attracted to this copper pipe. Not sure if you knew that. It's not going to be interested. It's not going to be pulled at all to this copper pipe. But if I take this same magnet, and it fits very nicely, not tightly, it can fit through this copper pipe without even touching the sides. I'm going to take this magnet, and I'm just going to drop it in the middle. And you're going to notice it's going to fall very differently than the pen did. Here we go. Where'd the magnet go? Where'd it go? Why did it take more time? Why, when I take this same magnet, and now I'm going to put a red pen on it as well. I'm going to slow down the fall of the red pen, and here we go. Magnet. You should be curious. <laughs> I could teach it like an engineer. FB equals ILB. Interested? No. Curious? Yes. Right, you should be. There was an age where you could be illiterate, and you'd do OK. It was a trades economy. You could ask for help in the grocery store. You'd get along all right. Our day, if you're illiterate, there are special challenges. There's luxuries that you'll have a hard time enjoying. You'd have a hard time with an email account. You wouldn't enjoy Facebook. You couldn't go online to surf and just have fun and learn things and check things out. 
This is a day and age where literacy is required. It's just a needed thing. I'm going to say that a scientific literacy is also becoming a standard packet that everybody needs. My father calls me the other day. He says, hey, Ryan, I need some help. I'm hooking up my HDMI to, I need an HDMI cable hooked up to my Blu-ray so that I can watch uh, my LED TV in 3D. <laughs> I said, Dad, what happened to your old CRT TV? He said, I got rid of the LCD TV. These are common terms. I went, I watched a movie in the movie theater. I looked nerdy and geeky like this. No one looked at me funny, because they were all wearing these too. It wasn't an odd thing anymore to have a basic technology like this. In fact, if you've ever seen a 3D movie as well, and you're a curious person, as I'm sure is a very big part of being a human being, you've probably lifted your 3D glasses during the movie. Huh. It's better with the glasses, isn't it? Did anybody stop to tell you how these glasses work? They're polarized. There's two kinds of light. Light comes at you like a wave. There's basically a vertical type of polarization and a horizontal polarization. And these two lenses, plain and simple and very cheaply manufactured as they are, have two different polarizations in them, just different orientations. So that if I actually was to take two different glasses, like this, you can see my eyes, like this, they disappear. Try that out next time you're in the movie theater. Take your glasses and flip them upside down. They become actually invisible to, to look through. How is that? You've got a vertical polarization filter lined up with a horizontal polarization filter, and it blocks out all light. Hmm. Enjoy your movie. <laughs> my message is to people who continuously say, I have a hard time with physics because the world is complicated. Yes, the world is complicated. I can't apologize to you for that. It's actually a good thing it's complicated because it gives us more opportunity at new technologies. The more we unravel the beautiful wonder and mystery of the world that we live in, the more technologies that become available to us. Old, common, old technologies that used to be very uncommon. I'm talking about relativity or something esoteric that used to be only for mathematical gurus. Ice-breaking, uh, amazing discoveries. We're now finding applications for. I have a GPS on my phone. I go on my phone, and somehow this phone is able to receive a signal from a satellite that, turns, that goes around the world twice a day. That satellite's traveling at 12,000 kilometers per hour. That's like Mach 12, depending on the humidity, temperature, and pressure. Of course, it's in space, so it's okay. 12,000 kilometers an hour, it's 14,000 kilometers away, which is just a little bit further than the diameter of the Earth. That's a faraway satellite and I get a GPS signal. You know what powers that satellite? About 50 watts. There's definitely more wattage in this room. About a 100 watt incandescent light bulb is double the wattage that powers the satellite. Are you fascinated by that? When we pick up this very commonplace technology, do we recognize that relativistic time delay and correction are necessary so these satellites don't crash into each other? We rely on this. It's a, would you agree it's a daily technology? It's just a day-to-day -day thing that we've just come to rely upon. I use the phone. I count the bars. How many cell towers? I don't care where they are. How many cell towers do I have? Do I have a good call or it, might it be dropped? If I walk into my friend's house, somehow there's a little black box in their house, a router, and it immediately detects my presence. How do you guys know each other? Have you guys been formally introduced? You know, you've got a little router on the floor that's talking to my phone at the speed of light. How is this working? It's pretty incredible. All of these commonplace technologies like Wi-Fi that allows us to send gigabytes, terabytes of information wirelessly, sending and receiving emails, downloading attachments, we've come to rely on them. Do you know what Wi-Fi stands for? It's pretty incredible stuff. Do you know, we were sitting around, uh, sitting around the table over Christmas, and uh, somebody brought up the fact that uh, a raw egg spins uh, for less time than a hard-boiled egg. I thought, oh, that's interesting that people know that because a raw egg has more internal friction so it's going to spin for a, a short period of time. It's a great egg test by the way so you don't have to put those X's on it, just give it a spin and now you know. Anyway, the conversation progressed so that we were talking about 
um, where the chicken comes from. And some goof at the table said, the chicken comes from the white of the egg. The what? I said, no, the chicken is yellow. It comes from the yellow yolk of the egg. Guess what happens? Quick draw. Whew. Smartphones come out. Everyone at the table, where, where, who, who did you guys get these things from? The smartphones are out, people are Googling it. We were both wrong. The chicken does not come from the white of the egg or the yolk of the egg. Now you're all curious. Where does the chicken come from? What blew me away is that everyone had smartphones. How did you guys get these smartphones? Are you guys like Texas cowboys? You pull them out and you're ready to go. Look at guys, if you were these fear of physics people and you've been trying to hide in this small club of people that are saying, I'm too afraid of that subject and I'm going to avoid those sciences altogether. I'm going to avoid them for life. Listen, that fan club is shrinking. Smartphones are here to stay. It's a very different world that we live in now. You're going to have to park some of those curiosities, some of those fears. Never, never avoid a topic like physics because the curiosity that is naturally bound in you is so much stronger. It's like a curiosity oppression. There's never been a generation where those day-to-day -day technologies and those day-to-day -day experiences that we use and rely on all the time have been more quickly available and quickly answerable. Thank you very much.